Hey folks, welcome to another edition of Construction Over Coffee. I'm your host, Jeff Raymond. I have here with me today, Dave Wagner. He's the VP of Product Marketing and Partner Development at Stack Construction Technologies, and he's coming at you out of Phoenix, Arizona. Dave, thanks for joining us. Well, thanks, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be here. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. So Dave, we're going to talk about a couple of things today. You know, the the thing that we like to focus on the most is obviously how do we inspire, attract, and influence that that next generation of talent to get into the AEC world, to get into the trades. Um, we're going to be talking about your experience in 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 the world, how you came up, what you've learned, and um, we'll talk about you know the industries as a whole in general. So. Let's start. Tell us a little bit about uh, yourself, who you are, how you got to where you're at. Well, that's great. So I have been working on helping to develop products for the software industry for about 20 years now. Uh, sort of fell into it back a, a little bit around the turn of the century uh, where I got involved in a company called Ose that predominantly was a printer company and uh, had a somewhat similar reputation that Xerox would have in the United States, but more from a European perspective. And there became this budding trend that they needed software to help drive their printers. Well, for many of their wide format printers, uh, their primary area of interest was printing for the construction industry, uh, blueprints essentially, and taking those from the old blueprint printers to more digital printers, uh, back probably, you know, 1997, 1998. And that was my initial start into this world that we call construction and predominantly working with general contractors and subcontractors on figuring out how to get the right uh, printouts that they needed to be able to do their work. Uh, that's led me to num another number of other companies, uh, including Informa and Innate, and now more recently Stack where I've spent quite a bit of time working with architects and engineers and general contractors, subcontractors and owners to pr pr primarily build products that focus on document management support and project management support for uh, general and subcontractors. Great. Great. And that's, um, you know, that's quite a journey there. You know, we talk to folks that are all over the industry on both the the actual GC side, um, and then the vendors and industries that support those industries as well. Was there anything in particular that attracted to you to the to the niche or the industry that you're in? I certainly enjoyed this the concept of construction, being able to see the results of something that is so incredibly tangible and beneficial to the rest of the world. So my journey mm -hmm. took me down into the software space, which allowed me to combine my interest in software with construction. So it was this blend of these two pieces that has uh, kept me in working in this business for the last 20 years. I also find the people in construction to be the, the, the heart of, of this country. And you get to work with a lot of people that you want to have a beer with afterwards. It's just a great group of people to work with and get to learn what they do and try to provide solutions that in many ways make their life easier. I mean, construction folks, they work hard and they work long hours and allowing them to go home and see their family maybe a few hours earlier each night because they've got a piece sure. of software that can help them do that is a, a driver that keeps me going. Agreed. Some of the best people I've ever met, you know, are, are in that industry and I find them to be more often than not, um, you know, fun, direct, very transparent, salt of the earth kind of people, yeah. and uh, definitely resonate. You know, you can you can share a beer with them, have a drink with them, and um, you know they're 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 very down to earth people. I find so you know recruiting in that industry and spending our days talking to those people, it doesn't really feel like work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, it feels like you're 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 catching up with. Uh, one of your best friends or getting to yes. know um, somebody that will probably be a friend in the future. Now, are you, are you originally from the Phoenix area or did you end up there later in life, midlife? It ended up there through a series of job changes, grew up in the greater Washington DC area, uh, mm -hmm. spent the beginning part of my career there, but as part of a job change, myself and a couple of my colleagues uh, went over and worked for a company that was based in Cleveland, Ohio. 
spent about five years there. And then that company um, was making a transition and moving a number of their employees to the more of the headquarters office in Phoenix. So I got transferred over to Phoenix and I've been there ever since. Just keep sliding west. Before you know it, you'll be in Hawaii. Yeah. So what was it what was it like going from the east coast to Phoenix besides the 20 degree increase in temperature? Yeah, that's the obviously the, the, the biggest change. And uh, coming from the D.C. area specifically, which is a beautiful, beautiful place, but has some of the worst traffic that I've ever experienced. It's uh, a bit more open here in Arizona. You're not having to dodge the Potomac River every time you try to go between Virginia and Maryland. So I think the, the lack of traffic and, of course, the uh, certainly the less in humidity that I had quite a bit of in both D.C. and Cleveland has been a nice change. But not a huge fan of July and August in Phoenix. we well, not going to try to pretend otherwise. And everyone will say at least it's a dry heat, but it, 115 it, is 115. Yeah. If, if people want to know what summer in Phoenix is like, you know, when you preheat your oven to 350, 400 degrees, yeah. that first instant when you open the oven up, yeah, that's dry heat too, but it doesn't feel very good. That's a little bit like summer in Phoenix. Yeah. We're, we're down in um, Jacksonville and St. John's, Florida. And <laughs> It's hot, but it's humid. You step yeah. out and you feel like you're stepping in a in a steam room. Yeah, that that fortunately we don't get too much of here. Yeah, cool. So, what does a day in the life look like for you right now? You know, so what is an average that, day like? Yeah, it, it's different every day. Uh, so, in some days, it's just handling the the specifics of the product marketing role, which is looking and seeing what's happening with industry trends. Uh, seeing what's going on with the competition, could be attending a trade show. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's making sure that the organization has the messaging and the content, uh, the, the raw content that it needs for so many of the other groups in the company I work for to be able to do their jobs. <coughs> so the, the, from the partner perspective, it's we're always looking for partners, other software products that share our vision and share typically our approach, but provide a capability that we currently don't have in our portfolio. So we've uh, met some great people um, from a variety of different companies, from some of the largest companies in the market to some of the smallest, and that we've created these partnerships and frequently software integrations with. So on any given day, that sort of is the, the core of what I do. However, I get heavily involved in, in some M&A activities. We've made three acquisitions in the last year and a half, uh, as well as work with many of our other leadership members around the strategy and where the company is going in the future. Congratulations on the uh, acquisitions over the past couple of years. Yeah, it's been very exciting. Uh, one thing that's super interesting to, to me, and I think a lot of folks in the industry, is that the AEC worlds as a whole, right? Um, there's a lot of great things about them, but one of the challenges that I think companies face that they're not always aware of is systems, processes, software that those companies are already using tends to be very antiquated. And the response that you get when it comes to change is, well, why would we change? It's working okay. And we've always done it this way. Yeah. Very dangerous thing to say in here, but, what um you know what 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 do you see in terms of the companies that are doing technology well compared to the companies that aren't doing tech well? I think it it all boils down to how you started the conversation. We're already doing it this way, and people are scared of the fact of how long is it going to take me to change, and if it doesn't work, am I right back to where I started from? So you can have the greatest technology in the world, but so much of it is about adoption. It's making sure that the technology can be adopted by the users that need to use it on a day-to-day -day basis. And because there are a lot of people in construction that are used to using Excel and Outlook and, mm -hmm. and other tools that are part of their standard process, and they work, um, <laughs> you don't want to scare them. But they, and they have to be productive with your software in a very short order of time, or it's just not going to be successful. They'll give up and go back to the way that they used to do it. So mm -hmm. where I've seen the companies that have had the most success are the ones that have focused on that, that user experience, making sure that it can be adopted and it can be used by all the people it was intended to in quick working order. 
uh, the days of a three-year ROI, they're done. They, they went away. If you cannot turn a product around and have it be profitable and successful for you, in, in realistically, it's got to be less than a year, but in many cases, six months, mm -hmm. it's just not going to work. And the construction industry really falls under that paradigm where these guys are so busy doing what they do to get the job done. They don't have time to be spending days, weeks, months, or even years to learn a new product and get it implemented to the way that it needs to work to fit their best practices. Agreed. The The speed of implementation, the speed of, of use, and the speed of that ROI starting to trickle in is important. Um you brought up a really good point. I want you to expand on that, which is, you know, when most vendors and most companies um, are in their sales process or their discovery process, I think something that, that that most folks are acutely unaware of is that fear of implementation, fear of change. How long is it going to take me to use this? What if my users don't like it? What if the onboarding is a real pain? And and talk about that and you know, how you work through that and overcome it and what um, what firms can do better when it comes time to that. One of the things I've done for a number of years is handled the ROI analysis um, that for the software products that I develop using a variety of different tools and calculators. And mm -hmm. when we when I train on it, one of the questions I always ask is, well, what is the number one factor you think in a positive ROI? And I'll always get people throwing out this feature or that feature or how many people are using it. And those are all heavily influenced, but what it really boils down to is ROI is mostly about adoption. If you think about adoption from three aspects, the, the um, number of people that are using in your organization, the number of projects that it's being used on in your organization, and the number and the amount of feature functionality that is being used of that product by the teams. Then, if you just say you only have, if you're using a product for say seventy five percent of your your projects, and it's being used by seventy five percent of your staff, and you're leveraging it, let's say for 50 or say 75% again of the features that are available to you that you were sold on it. That mm -hmm. means you're getting less than 50% of the power that that software could be providing your organization. So wow. what's it, what people sit and forget is that having that commitment from your leadership team and having the right training and making sure that you're you're implementing what you consider to be your best practices by that company and making a piece of software that, that can be done in relatively easy fashion makes all the difference in the world. And it makes the difference between a system that quite honestly will be used for the next 5, 10, 15 years or one that basically people give up on and they don't renew it again when the renew comes due at the end of the year. Agreed. What um, When you're talking to these leaders, right? And you're having these conversations about, well, this is what your process is, and this is what it could be. What are what are some traits that you've noticed the most successful companies have, whether traits at the leadership level, company traits or values? What, what sticks out to you as the people who, you know, end up doing this really successfully? Um, at, at the leadership level, it's commitment to, to the product, making sure that their people understand that they're committed to making this work and mm -hmm. they will be provided the time and the resources that are required to make it work. Uh, I've unfortunately run across some implementations in the past where the, the leadership team so signed off on it, but there wasn't a level of commitment. And then as soon as something goes wrong, there is a, a game of finger pointing. So when you have the entire team is bought on and, and basically all going in the same direction and looking to see how it can be successful for everyone, you're going to have good implementations. You're going to have a, a situation where everyone is happy about you know, where things started and more importantly, where things are going. So that is certainly probably the top trait, which is a commitment from all the people that are involved, not just the end users, but but also the champions and the leadership and the people that that signed the check in the end, on, uh, you know, to decide to bring the product in in the first place. Um, the other piece I would say is I mentioned a few times this concept of best practices and people have their best practices. It doesn't necessarily mean 
that you have to do everything the same way when you move from one system to another. So organizations that recognize what the end goal is, but yet there may be a better way to accomplish that end goal, leveraging what a solution can bring, are also the ones that I see have been successful. Said in an, a different way or the opposite direction, companies that haven't been are successful are ones that essentially just try to implement exactly everything they're doing today in a new piece of software. Uh, gotcha. Because that may not really be optimal for what they need and what the software can do for them. That's an interesting point. And I think, the, you know, that's applicable to a lot of things, not just software. But yeah, we see it all the time in recruiting where, you know, when we're when we're handling a company's recruiting, they're trying to do what wasn't working, but they were doing it before. It's almost like we're saying, follow this process. And they said, okay, we're going to follow that process, but we're going to interpret it the way we think it should be done. And I, I think it goes across the spectrum, software, services, products. And um, I'm curious, like, if you see anything specific to the AEC world, right? What What's different about this group of buyers and users compared to other industries outside of, you know, we need a more immediate return on ROI? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um Certainly construction has this bad reputation of being IT adverse. Uh, yes. this, we've, we've all heard the same study that put us right down there with, with education and agriculture is the least adoptive of technology in the industry. Uh, that's not been my experience. I mean, it certainly exists out there, but I've seen construction really starting to embrace technology, whether it's BIM or AI or wearables or drones are so many other different technologies, it's starting to recognize that there is value out there to not necessarily just using the old standard way of doing everything and bringing things forward in a very positive and efficient manner. So it, it, so it feels like to me, things are starting to change where construction teams and construction leaders recognize there's a lot of value in what technology can bring and how they can leverage that value. When I think of these old antiquated, you know, construction firms. It, it reminds me, um, you know, the stereotype where you go in and everyone's keeping the drawings in a filing cabinet somewhere. Right. Yeah. And, 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 you know, people are like, no, that can't be true. There's no way people do that. And then you meet some of the smaller, older mom and pop shops and so oh, these people are really keeping all of their records in a filing cabinet. And there's, you know, can you use an iPad? And they kind of look at you like three, like you have three heads. Yeah, it's it's funny you mentioned that. This goes back not yeah. that many years, but I was visiting uh, with a Fortune 50 company, uh, top of the top, uh, very uh, great reputation overall in, mm -hmm. in our world. And uh, we were showing them a construction document management system to help manage all of their construction projects, of which they had many. And the gentleman we talked to was interested in what we had to say. He goes, but you know, we just implemented a new system. And my thought was, oh gosh, I wonder who they're using, you know, probably one of our competitors. And he goes, would you like to see it? And I said, sure. You know, so we walked over to this big warehouse and he opened the door and with great, great pride, he mentioned, look, we color coded every one of our hanging folders. So people know exactly what part of the warehouse they need to go to, to find the right drawings. And that was their solution at the time. I'm sure they've moved on to something a little bit more modern since then, but I was just dumbstruck that a company with such a high reputation was still basically just using hanging folders with colored tabs. You know, it, it's funny. It, it, it's interesting because you think, you know, when you think of companies to get to that size or, you know, I think for me, if a company is doing even moderately well, you think they're doing something right. Yeah. And it could be a number of things like we've walked in and we'd be like, oh, that's how you interview and recruit. And you're so-and-so like, how did you, it, it's almost tongue in cheek, but it's like, how did you, how did you make it this far? Yeah, I mean, exactly. it's, it's like that. And uh, I'm sure you have, I'm sure you have a couple of war stories like that. <laughs> yeah. The technology yeah. piece is super interesting too. You brought up drones. We interviewed a gentleman about two years ago um, that was on the residential services side primarily which I think has some of the most interesting uh, stories, in the residential world. And at the time there, his company was employing drones 
that could essentially be released. They would circle the property, you know, take all their photos and essentially spit out a spit out a, a a series of drawings and sketches and you know plan grids that said, okay, here are the measurements. This is what you need, and voila. Yeah. Just ironically, as part of my partner duties, I met with one of those software companies just yesterday, and they there are some really good ones out there, exactly doing what you just described. Uh, they're revolutionizing, especially the, the roofing industry, being able to grab so much of that information through the drones. Yeah, it's I mean, at the click of a button, as the saying, here you yeah. go. Yep. It's wild. Um, it's wild. You know, you think 15, 20 years ago, how far we've come in the technology field. And, and it's such an interesting field to me because um, I feel like once every three to five years, there's this technologic, there's this technological revolution. You know, recently it's drones. Before that, it was the premise of AI. And who knows what, you know, I'm kind of like, well, are robots going to be doing our jobs in five, yeah. 10, 15, yeah. 20 years? You know, it's, it's fascinating to me. Um, well, the cloud certainly changed in the software space. It certainly yes. changed everything, um, really became to the point where it was the de facto standard in most of the software and construction, you know, now for the last certainly five to 10 years, but it really changed things. It did. And I'm curious too, is there anything out there right now that's really, you know, outside of the drones and, and some other stuff, is there anything out there that you have your eyes on that? When you look at it, you say, this is really interesting and we should be paying attention to this technology. Yeah, I think there are a number of uh, industries out there that are interesting. Uh, the, the other one is one of the core aspects, and I'm a little outside of you know what I do today, but um, mm -hmm. is capturing progress while the job is actually going on. So that could be as simple as you know capturing the people that come on site and when they leave site, but really gets into the progress of the site, the materials that's used, the materials that's installed. And as you would imagine, that is an incredibly manually driven process of, of checking things off as they've been delivered to really understand the progress. And what we're starting to see with drones, but cameras in general is really starting to to under, be able to use that to visually combine with AI to take pictures of things and know what kind of progress has been made. So within that in construction progress, understanding actuals is a term frequently used in the field with the actual um, progress has been made on what actual items, we're starting to see technology uh, really take some leaps and bounds. Um, the, the other area of technology that we're seeing that's not nearly as glitzy as, I guess, a drone or camera work or things along those lines, but is the idea of the, the platform, where you're starting to see more and more, especially the bigger companies, start to introduce more platform plays where it's more of a one-stop shop with core integrations to provide what companies need. Uh, it's... It's a way of sort of creating an environment of, of all the, where all the software sort of works a little bit more seamlessly together, whether it's now from the same company or through um, chosen uh, partners, trusted partners, but you're starting to get much more of an integrated platform. What we saw is recently is certainly five or 10 years ago is there were especially a lot of applications that were coming into the marketplace, but they were, they're each individual little silo, their own set of data. And it became very difficult to share data between those systems. And we're starting to see that change quite a bit as the industry grows. Yes. I was reading a study. I don't remember who, who had done it, um, but it was, it was actually, I remember now it was our ATS that we use Loxo and their CEO, Matt Chambers was talking about, you know, in the, in that software industry, you know, siloed data is going to become more of a burden than an asset over the next, you know, several years, because it's just one more thing to manage. And in our processes, if we have to go through and update five or six sources of truth, each time there's movement in the recruiting process, it's a huge, it's a huge pain in the butt. Yeah. And, you know, you look at the complexity of that construction industry as a whole, and, you know, they have similar problems, but on a much larger scale where you're not maybe managing 
you know, one or two processes or five processes, you're managing processes within processes and projects within projects. And um, if, if things are not interconnected and ideally updating themselves in real time, um, you, my friend, have a lot of issues going on. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. I think the other one, I mean, there are some obvious ones. We talked about the cloud. Uh, you know, BIM is starting to see more and more exposure in other parts of construction and, and use farther into the construction uh, process than we've seen before. But AI is the other one. And of course, that's not unique to construction. AI is you know, the biggest technology trend that we see anywhere. Uh, the construction certainly has a place for that as well. <clears throat> so I think that's the other um, area that we're going to see just uh, grow logarithmically over the next few years is the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning to be able to automatically do some things in construction. And in the past were required by labor. And as I know is near and dear to your heart, uh, Jeff, um, that's the biggest crisis that construction has right now is labor. It's finding good professional people that can do the job. So if you can start to eliminate some of the administrative burdens of which there are many in construction and have these the, the people you can get focus on the work that that they really are uniquely qualified to do and takes decisions, uh, now you, you've created a nice mix. So I think we'll see AI continue to move forward here, especially over the next few years. Agreed. If you look outside of the AI, the cloud, is there anything else that really sticks out to you in terms of yeah, I think I think the AI, the cloud, the platform play, building information modeling, those are probably the biggest ones that I'm seeing really starting to gain traction uh, in the industry as we move forward. Got it. Okay, cool. And let's shift the conversation for a moment towards the attraction of in people in the industry, because I think that's an important one we want okay. to touch. You know, obviously, well, you don't work in the construction industry as say a soup or a PM or an estimator, you deal with these folks daily, right? You're yeah. talking yeah. and you know, you've been doing this for some length of time. What have you seen change? Um, you know, if we go far back as you can, but I like to say over the last 10, 15 years, how have the trades and how have these industries changed from a labor standpoint and from, you know, a, a, a people and getting people in the actual industry standpoint, how has that changed? And what are you um, saying? For, for me, the huge change in the industry came starting, what, 2007, 2008, and then progressed certainly, you know, 2009, 2010. Those were dark days for the construction industry. Um, and in quite a few people ended up giving up on the industry at that point in time. They just left. So as a consequence, what we've seen is uh, ever since then is construction itself has come back relatively robustly. Um, we haven't had that same wealth of people that uh, were in the industry or have decided to get into the industry. It, it's a bit mind boggling when you think about it, that every kid I've ever known has played with Legos and Lincoln logs and pushed a dump truck around in the sandbox. I and mean, it's, it's an industry that is kids. It's, it's right at the top of what everyone loves to do. But at some point in time, as, as this average child progresses through high school and post high school ages, this design, this concept of construction is a is a great industry to get into, has somehow evaporated a little bit, and I I don't quite understand why it is that you know and you ask an eight year old, a lot of them are going to say they want to build stuff and they want to you know use a dump truck, put them at 18, they want to be doctors and lawyers. And, you know, some of it I know, of course, has to do with, you know, the typical uh, salary that someone is getting. But the, the value that I talked about at the beginning that you get from actually being able to construct something and know it's going to be there for 50, 100, 200 years has a tremendous amount of, of um, enjoyment in my heart. And I would think it would for others. And I think if people understood more than I know that's what your, your organization helps us understand is the value of what construction brings and the excitement that you can get and all the things that are changing in the world that have to be built. It's a very exciting industry and should be one that we can attract more and better people for every single day. It's one of my favorite topics to talk about. I feel, I feel like <laughs> I, 
we could talk about this for for hours on end and you know it, it, it's what you nailed on you know there, there's been a shift in preferences i think there's been a shift in um in 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 how the industry is viewed and then you know you, that 2007 8 9 that's one of my favorite periods not to have not to have lived uh-huh. through that. That sucked if you were in the industry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was not a fun point in my career. Trust me on that one. It 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 was atrocious. Um, you know, you you look back, right, and you you look at that event, and you can call it a black swan, refer to it whatever you want. It, it was unlike anything that had been seen in that industry before. Um, and then you look and you say, well, how did that impact the industries moving forward? Well. On the talent side, you know, you had that whole generation of individuals. If you graduated, especially in the architecture engineering side, mm-hmm. um, there was no new work being done for a couple of years. Yeah. Both at the at the private sector and the government sector, there was a freeze on on spending, right? And then yeah. you had entire I, I wouldn't say generations, but you had, you know, two to three years of individuals who may have wanted to go on to school and get their, you know, BS in architecture, construction management, engineering, whatever it was, they said, "Uh uh-uh, I'm out. I got to pick something else. Yep. And similar to what you saw in 2020, where you had, I think, a lot of folks retiring early Yeah. that said, hey, this is, you know what, I'm going to take an early retirement. This is just too volatile. And um, in 2008, the same thing happened. And it feels like there was this period of time that was almost lost in a way where the knowledge that should have been passed on wasn't passed on and where the individuals who should have or wanted to enter those industries didn't. So now you notice that I think one of the biggest gaps in in talent for companies is individuals who have, we'll call it say 12 to 15 years of experience. Yep. Um, Well, what do you know? They were, that was their point when they graduated and they should have been entering the market and didn't. Yeah, you nailed it. That it's we're in difficult. That's, you know, that's your project manager today. That's running that job. Uh, that would be that person that graduated in 2008, 2009, 2010. And there just aren't as many of them as there used to be. It's a, a tough situation. Uh, that is the number one thing that we hear. We just don't have the people to do the work so, and, and from a software perspective, there is a value to that because it's most of the software that's out there today is not attempting to replace the people that do the job. They're temp- they're replacing that administrative burden of collecting data, re-entering the data in three different places. It's eliminating those headaches so they can focus on the things that they're really being paid to do. Uh, but. <clears throat> We still need more and better, and we still need more people in this industry building with all the construction that we're going to need as we continue to move forward here. Agreed. You know, we hear it all the time. It's not the, it's not the, what we're hearing is we we can take on more work. The issue is people. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, We have the know-how to do it. We just don't have enough of the people that can actually go out and do it and implement it. And you're at the point where, you know, every owner can't believe they're saying it but yeah you know they're turning down work Mm -hmm. because they don't have enough people and what we're seeing what our research and our our you know experience has shown us is the the industry the companies that are getting hit the hardest um are the smaller and mid-sized maybe regional firms or you know smaller gcs that are either getting started or you know maybe they've had a couple of key clients for years and they haven't really expanded beyond that the challenge they're seeing is if something, if if there is a drastic change in the project and they need to expand or there's more work coming in, they can't just pull two soups here, a couple PMs here, get some feed fo- field folks there. They can't do that. Whereas you have some of the larger players, maybe in our top 100 or even really large regional players, what's it to them, not downplaying it, but what's it to them to move, you know, a couple folks here, a couple folks there, Maybe it just stretches them out, but the folks at those firms tend to be cross-trained a little better. And what we're seeing is this talent shortage, it's hurting those smaller and mid-sized players the most. And I think that's going to be continue to be exacerbated over the next decade um, where they're just 
they're getting hurt. And I don't think it's, I don't think it's going to resolve itself, unfortunately, unless we get an actual shift in the people that are coming into the trades and we cross train them. And um, it's a, it's a tough place to be. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Right now it's tough. I'm curious in, in your, in your world specifically, are you seeing the same thing um, across the board or is it, you know, bear with me. I'm not really, I'm, I'm not a tech recruiter, but um, for example, do you folks struggle to find folks with machine learning experience or DevOps, or is it pretty easy across the board? Uh, well, no, it's not easy. Uh, certainly the the whole tech development side is, is in pretty high demand these days. So finding mm-hmm. good people is, is certainly not the easiest thing to do. But there we are, what we're seeing is opportunities to hire people. Uh, <laughs> so I don't think it's as, as bad as the construction front is there. We, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if certain people that could have gone construction decided to go the software engineering or software development route. So, you know, we do have that, um, op- we have opportunities to find people, but it's not as easy as probably some other fields are, maybe some of the business areas where, uh, mm-hmm. or the legal profession where it does feel like there's maybe a few more lawyers out there than we've had in the past available to be hired up. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would say the tech space is under construction, but still on the difficult side. Agreed. I mean, you know, I, I, as a general rule of thumb, I try to avoid a lot of the mainstream news. If you turn it on, it's all doom and gloom in the tech industry. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I think perspective has a lot to do with it. Um Again, not a tech recruiter, but the firms that view this as an opportunity to get the people that maybe they couldn't get before mm-hmm. that were on the fence, now's a great time to do it. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, if you have an opportunity and you leverage it, I think you can do fairly well for yourself. Um, if we look ahead, right? Let's if we if we look at the talent market ahead. Um, you know, one thing we talked about is we have to get more people in the industry, right? And a lot of it, you know, we've talked about this on the show a couple of times um, is, you know, how do we make the industry more attractive? And I always like to say, well, just, you know, if you want to see where you stand, do a survey, go in a room, get a hundred high schoolers in there, or even a hundred middle schoolers and say, raise your hand if you want to go into tech. Now, great free industry folks raise their hand. They love it. You know, uh, there's a push to get kids in coding, which is phenomenal and it's needed. And I wish there was that same energy and and passion and um, you know those programs are more widely available for our industry. And then you say, raise your hand if you want to be a lawyer, a doctor, tons mm-hmm. of hands. Right. And then you say, raise your hand if you want to be an architect. And they're like, software architect? No, uh, <laughs> architect, the building architect. Yeah, right. If you want to be a mechanical engineer, and they're like, what for Tesla? No, like you know, at H on the HVAC and plumbing side. It'd raise your hand if you want to go in construction and just the, I think the enthusiasm starts to really wane. And a lot of that, it, it starts at home. It starts in school. You know, I know that the, the, the stigma growing up that was attached was the only people who went into those industries were those who weren't capable of anything else, which is thankfully growing up in a blue collar family. I knew that was BS, but those stigmas, I mean, they have lasting impacts. People yeah. say, why would I want to swing a hammer? Well, it's not all about swinging a hammer. Yes, you can do that. But, um, you know, that stigma and that enthusiasm, it needs to shift if we're to continue that. And I'm curious, how? what are some potential solutions to that that you see? How do we get there? Well, I don't know if it's a solution that we can impact, but I think one of the things I find interesting is if you go here and watch TV and pick out a show, You can't throw a rock and not hit six legal shows, 10 doctor shows, police shows. But Mm. how many shows can you tell me focus in on a family or a business around the construction industry? How many movies are there? if If you look at what's being pushed down our throat about what's exciting and what you should see, there's virtually nothing in the world of construction. Um, so, and I know that's, that's a much bigger play and one that we can't personally change, Mm -hmm. but it's interesting. The dynamic that is viewed from at least the Hollywood perspective is this is not a career that's exciting. 
they could make it exciting because it is exciting and the results of it could be exciting uh, and certainly could be the this, this starting point for a whole lot of different things. But what I think, so, but with that, with that said, what tangibly can be done is it is more what you described. It's more getting into the schools. It's more finding ways to highlight uh, these major projects, <clears throat> how interesting they are and what they bring to the table and how they change people's lives. And I think if people got more exposure to what it is to work in the construction industry, uh, then you would have a lot more people raising their hand in that example you gave in high school than we're seeing right now. But I don't think people have really much of any idea as to what it is and what's involved and what goes on. So I think it, we, it starts with creating that education and that awareness to what it means to be a construction professional, what it means to be an architect, a civil engineer, as you mentioned earlier, or certainly any part of a, a true construction project management professional that's actually on site, making sure that job is being done it, on time and under budget, which is, you know, certainly the key here of everything we do. I love that. You know, the, the concept of, you think about it, what mainstream construction show is there? And really, I, I jokingly say Bob the Builder, but that's it. I mean, and that's it. <laughs> You're right. It's, you know, <laughs> you have so many medical and legal and law enforcement, which are great. Now, how do we get that in the, in the construction industry? The other right. point is when you do see folks in the industry portrayed, you know, it's always a side character and you look at how are they portrayed? Well, it's usually a brutish dude that, you know, is usually catcalling and really not that bright. That's how they're yes. portrayed. Yes. And that uh, negative stigma that is not true, um, you know, and it's just being portrayed. So yeah, uh, yeah absolutely. Wow. I think there are two stigmas. There is uh, someone that dresses just like Steve Jobs and that's your architect. Uh, mm -hmm. That only eats, you know, tofu, and uh, that, that's that's one prototypical architect. And then the other one is the opposite end of the spectrum of what you just described. Uh, you know, someone that's basically sitting there, you're right, doing cat calls, and and neither of those is going to be very attractive to the vast majority of the population. But yet they represent a tiny, tiny fraction of what I'm sure the two of us experience every day. The the other area I think there's opportunity for is. Construction historically has been a male dominated um, mm -hmm. industry and it shouldn't be anymore. There's no reason it needs to be. It's just ridiculous. And, and focusing in on 51% of our population and what they can bring to this industry is an incredibly uh, untapped set of uh, people that I don't think construction has gone after, whether it's the old boys network or whatever the case is, but limiting itself. And I don't, by no means do I mean that, you know, that, would, that we don't have women in the construction industry. There are some absolutely phenomenal women in this industry today, but I think the industry could even push harder to go after early age more and more. It's not just a male, it, it should not be a male dominated industry the way it has been for many, many years. Agreed. Times have changed and opportunities should be available to everybody. Absolutely. What I, what I do like is there are some firms out there that are, that are attempting to influence and get more, I'm looking for the word here, that are attempting to be more attractive to, mm -hmm. uh, to women and to get them involved and to get them engaged and to, you know, give it to them as a, make it be a real opportunity. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's 50% of the population, right? 51% of the population right there. Yeah, that's absolutely. Catering to and trying to get them involved. And I know, I know tech was um, the same way for a very long time. Yes. And there's been a push over the last several years to, you know, invite the other gender into the industry, which I think is needed. And, um, hopefully gone are the days where, you know, you have to check X, Y, and Z demographic box to fit into the industry. Those mm -hmm. times, hopefully they're gone. Yeah, that would be, that'd be fantastic. But I, you bring up a great point. STEM as sort of as a, a technology area um, has done a really nice job of making it much more inclusive and construction could probably learn from some of the things they've done on how to do that effectively. Yes. Agreed. Um, Something else that's really interesting to our viewers is about making, you know, making the industry attractive 
to women because again the stigma that most people share women included is that the men in the industry are those brutish catcalling um misogynist and that's maybe those folks make up a very very tiny portion as they would every other any other industry but <laughs> right yeah uh, it's just simply not true right and how do we how do you we make that industry more attractive to women and get them engaged get them involved and how do we help them see it as hey this is a this is a really cool opportunity with a great quality of life and great earnings what can you know at the at an individual level what can folks do and then at a company level yeah, I, I think it comes back again to that education, making sure that everyone, but in specifically in this example, that women understand what construction professionals do, um, that it's not you know, just about sitting on the edge and, and catcalling the women as they go by, but what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. And one of the things that I think is incredibly interesting about construction is no two days are ever the same. Um, and for <clears throat> many people, you know, th their idea of the worst job possible is essentially having to do the same thing over and over and over. And construction is, it couldn't be any more unlike that. So making sure that we create that visibility into what, you, 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 what people do on a day-to-day -day basis. You asked me, what, what do I do? What I think the construction industry needs to do is make it clear what their folks do so people can see, wow, this is exciting. This is different. This, this is well-paying. This has got job security for me you know, at, at a professional level. Um, and making that apparent to everyone, but there are there's no job in construction that jumps out at me that a woman couldn't do today that a man is doing. So they need to be to see the same thing and trying to remove that stigma that for some reason women are not can't be part of construction is absolutely ludicrous. So it's <clears throat> whether it's commercials, whether it's ads, whether it's education, whether it's getting into the, the high schools or the colleges and making sure that people understand that this is a profession that you can really get your really get your arms behind and, and make it part of your career and have a job that is never going to be the same on any given day, I think would be incredibly appealing to everyone, and uh, men and women included. Agreed. And I'm looking at the time. I know we'll wrap up soon, but you touched on a great point. Colleges, university, um, and I, I'd go a step further and say even middle school and high school. Oh, I, it, yeah. Thing is really interesting because, again, nothing against college, right? I think it's great for people, but I think as a whole, college over the last 20 years has been looked at um, as the only way to success. Mm -hmm. You know, there are certain professions that do require degrees. There are certain, you know, segments of the industries that, you know, you, you would probably do better with a degree than without. But the idea that you absolutely need it to excel in any area in that AEC world is utterly and patently false. Yeah. And last year or two, um, since 2020, you've seen folks kind of wake up to that and they realize, well, college is really expensive and some folks would rather be working. And I think, you know, a great, a great time to start making those career options become available to folks is when they're at that high school or middle mm -hmm. school starting to think about, do I want to go to college? Do I not? Well, you know, if, if you want to go be an architecture, an engineer, sure. But um, if you want to do something else, right, maybe you don't need to go to college and you should start having that conversation with your parents, with your family, with your friends, with your, with your guidance counselor and seeing what those options are. And I think just making, um, those possibilities known to folks and reinforced throughout their high school and college years, that would be great. Um, again, nothing against college. Yeah. Nothing, but I don't think it's the end all be all that people have been told for the last 20 years either. Now, again, I know in tech that might be a little different, um, but you know, I'm, I'm curious, what are your thoughts on that? On I couldn't agree with you more. I think the United States as a whole has not done a tremendous job on making sure people understand that a, a learning a trade, getting an advanced education doesn't necessarily have to be college. It can be an advanced education towards a trade that you become an expert in. And uh, you know, other countries that we've seen around the world have done a better job of destigmatizing that. Is that is an incredibly successful career and a way you can lead your life. 
So I absolutely agree. I think college for certain things, I'm not even convinced as the day marches forward that even some of the tech side will necessarily need the college degree, that we're going to start to see more and more tech schools pop up that train you how to code, how to be a system architect, how to handle DevOps. And that will be a focus without having to go through the full four years of college uh, that, that people sort of assume that you have to today to, to be successful, but it's just not the case. And I think you make up some great examples of many roles in construction do need a, an advanced education. It just doesn't necessarily have to be a college education. It can be a trade advanced education. So you understand the processes and the best practices and what you need to do to be successful in this industry. Agreed. The um, two things you brought up really interesting about the U.S. as a whole not doing a great job educating people. Um, can you get that? Thank you. The U.S. as a whole not doing a great job educating people uh, at a young age. We had a guest in the show from Australia. I didn't know a lot of this, but the GDP of Australia is made up such a large swath of construction that it's almost like a government initiative where hey, we need to educate and bring people in here. And there's a lot of really cool programs that seek to inform, educate, and expire to get that next generation in. And I mm -hmm. think that another guest we had on, um, you know, goes out of his way to educate people on what you can make in the trade. Now, he's more specific to the HVAC world, but, you know, letting people know that they can be pulling in fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year, you know, after trade school with zero debt, phenomenal. Yeah. And I yeah. think- Yep. People see the numbers in front of them. The relationship um, or the stigma to that to the trades it changes completely. If you could have told, you could have told your average seventeen, eighteen year old, ten years ago that hey, you can you know you can be making a hundred, hundred and fifty thousand dollars ten years in your career in these industries if you're good at what you do with no debt and you could be your earnings potential was four years longer starting at age seventeen or eighteen. Man, sign yeah. me up. <laughs> yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. So in closing, I know we got to wrap up here soon. Is there anything that you really, you know, that you want to end on that you want to share with our audience and our guests? No, I, I nothing else I can think of. I've thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. Um, I, I would, my, I guess my wrapping up words would be that, Construction is a wonderful industry to be in, whether you're developing software for it, whether you're you know, building out the, the drawings, whether you're actually swinging the hammer or you're managing the project. Uh, but it is, it's quite honestly an underrated profession that is moving forward with the times in an appropriate way. And I would encourage anyone that's interested in it. I know I've said this a few times, but a, your day will be different every day. Uh, this is the career for you. Agreed. Um Dave, if folks want to reach you, what's the what's the best way for them to reach you? Uh, send me an email uh, to my stack account, and that's D Wagner, W-A-G-N-E-R at stackct.com. Okay. Dave, it was great having you on the show. Um, really unique, fresh perspectives. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Thanks for coming on board. Thank you very much, Jeff. It was a great pleasure.